Alright guys, Dominic here for Kit Guru, and today we are back with another extensive game benchmark video. This time we are checking out the hotly anticipated Dying Light 2. So, developed by Techland, this is of course the sequel to 2015's Dying Light, but Dying Light 2 is actually using the new C engine, and it has plenty of ray traced effects as well. So today we test over 30 different GPUs, looking at both high and low settings, so you know exactly what sort of performance you can expect. Jumping right into the settings menu then, first of all we have the main video settings menu, with things like resolution, upscaling and vsync, and you can also choose between the game's three different presets here, where you've got low, medium and high. There is an advanced settings menu though, where we get access to a few more options to tweak. I wouldn't say it's a super extensive selection here, with the options mainly focusing on different lighting settings like shadows, global illumination and ambient occlusion, but there are at least a few different settings to tweak. As for the actual settings I'm going to be using for the testing today, we did the bulk of our benchmarking using the high preset which maxes everything out but without enabling ray tracing, which we will get to later in the video. We also reran a bunch of older and slower cards using the low preset as well, to give you an idea of what sort of performance you can expect from the lights of the GTX 1060 and RX 570 in Dying Light 2. For the benchmark sequence we're using for all of our testing, I used a section early on in the game when the player has just arrived in Villador and you are trying to get down to the bazaar. Many of you who have played the game will know the early forest section is even more demanding, so I did think about benchmarking there, but after playing through the first three hours or so, I just don't think that's necessarily representative of the overall experience, as past that initial hour, the player is in the city. This section I benchmark though sees the player jumping off platforms, running on the rooftops and getting on a zip wire, so I'd say it is pretty representative of the core gameplay. All of our testing was done on a system supplied to us by CyberPower, and it's based on Intel's i9-12900K CPU. That's plugged into an MSI Z690 Carbon Wi-Fi motherboard, along with 32GB of Corsair Dominator Platinum DDR5 memory clocked in at 5200MHz. And as for drivers, of course we're using the latest at the time of testing, so for NVIDIA that is the 511.65 driver, and for AMD it's the 22.1.1 driver, both of which crucially promise support for Dying Light 2. Kicking off the performance numbers then, we'll start with all of the data when using the high quality preset, and then we'll come on to the low preset. So here are the 1080p results, but as we did end up testing over 30 GPUs, I've actually split the chart into two, so we'll start with the lower performing half. Right at the bottom then, we have a handful of GPUs that I just wouldn't consider playable. With the GTX 1650 up to even the 1650 Super, unable to maintain the 1% lows above 30 FPS. The RX 5500 XT 4GB is actually the first card able to do so, and while personally I would want a lot 60 FPS at all times, I guess this is kind of the bare minimum that would get you by. Interestingly, the 8GB 5500 XT is barely any faster here, so Dying Light 2 doesn't appear to be particularly VRAM heavy. Above that, we get to the 6500 XT, the GTX 1070 and the GTX 1660 Super, which all deliver average frame rates in the mid 40 FPS region, though the RTX 3050 is a class ahead, delivering 55 FPS on average, with the 1% lows just falling below 50 FPS. Moving up the chart then, we next come to Vega 56. And I do want to point out here that Vega 56 is absolutely smashing the GTX 1070 and is even on par with the GTX 1080. So it's definitely another case of AMD fine wine coming through and delivering decent performance for the Vega architecture. Vega 64 as well is delivering over 60 FPS at high settings, which is honestly not bad at all in Dying Light 2. Stepping up to the higher tier of GPUs now with the top half of our chart, the good news is every single GPU you can see here was able to keep the 1% lows above 60 FPS, so you will get a good experience at high settings. That starts with the RTX 2060 Super and RX 6600 towards the bottom, 
And we can also see the 5700 XT, RTX 3060, RTX 2070 Super, and the RX 6600 XT. All four of those GPUs are clustered very close together around the high 70s to low 80 FPS region. We then do have a bit of a jump up to the RTX 3060 Ti and RX 6700 XT, which both deliver basically identical performance at 103 FPS on average, though that isn't ideal for AMD as usually the 6700 XT is closer to the RTX 3070. Speaking of the RTX 3070, that GPU delivers 117 FPS on average, making it 8% slower than the RX 6800. The RX 6800 XT, however, is neck and neck with the RTX 3080, while the 6900 XT averages over 150 FPS at 1080p. Lastly, the RTX 3090 is the top dog here, hitting 166 FPS with the 1% lows at 144. Next, we're moving up to 1440p, again still using the high preset. We can move a bit faster here as there are a lot of GPUs unable to hold the frame rate above 30 FPS. Even the 1660 Super can't handle it at these settings. The RTX 3050 is actually the first GPU able to do so, with Vega 56 and the RTX 2060 only slightly faster at this resolution. Vega 64 is also still doing a bit better with an average frame rate in the mid 40s but its 1% lows were still dipping below the 40 FPS figure. As for the faster half of our chart then, 1440p is clearly no joke at these settings, with the likes of the 2060 Super, RX 5700 XT, and even the RTX 2070 Super just unable to hit 60 FPS. Those cards are still doing okay with frame rates in the high 40s or mid 50s, but if you're like me and want a locked 60 FPS, you will need something more. In fact, the RTX 3060 Ti is the first GPU able to deliver that kind of experience, where it's once more on level pegging with the RX 6700 XT. The RTX 2080 Ti and RTX 3070 are next, with both cards averaging just over 80 FPS, though the RX 6800 is a bit faster still, averaging 92 FPS. It's another fairly big jump up to the 6800 XT however, which hit 105 FPS on average, and the RTX 3080 isn't much faster there either. We can see that the RTX 3090 is still the top dog though, landing an extra few FPS compared to the RX 6900 XT. As for 4K, I'm sure many of you can guess where this is going. We did test less cards at this resolution to begin with, but on the first half of our chart we can clearly see not a single card, even the RTX 2070 Super and RX 6600 XT could hit 30 FPS, so we can move right on to the second half of the chart. This really does show just how demanding 4K gaming can be, with even the RTX 2080 Ti and RTX 3070 struggling here with their 1% lows in the mid-30 FPS region. The 6800 XT and RTX 3080, even the 6900 XT, are solid enough, delivering around 60 FPS on average, but with the 1% lows a bit further behind. Crucially though, even the RTX 3090 isn't delivering a locked 60 FPS experience, though its average frame rate did hit 70 FPS. That is going to do it for our look at the high settings though, as I am sure many of you will want to dial back a few things here and there in order to boost performance. Looking at preset scaling then, here we're going to compare low, medium and high settings on a GTX 1660 Super at 1080p. I've also added in what I call the bare minimum settings, as the low preset doesn't actually turn everything down as low as they will go. Contact shadows and ambient occlusion can actually be disabled entirely if you want, though considering the performance gains are marginal over the low preset, it's not advisable. Dropping from the high preset to the medium preset though will win you back 19% extra performance, or almost 10 FPS 
in this example. Dropping from the medium preset then to the low preset will boost frame rates by another 27%. Overall, I'd say Dying Light 2 doesn't seem massively scalable. There's definitely some scope here, but it's not amazing. Techland has stated they are looking to expose some additional video settings though, which hopefully will help. For those of you on lower end or older GPUs then, you will probably want to start at the low preset and then adjust what you can. Even then, in our benchmarks at 1080p using the low preset, we can see some GPUs are still struggling. The likes of the extremely popular GTX 1060 and the 1650 Super both being unable to maintain 60 FPS with settings basically as low as they will go is definitely a bit disappointing if you ask me. The frame rates delivered are still playable, so particularly if you have a variable refresh rate monitor, you will probably be fine. But again, it would be good to see a bit more scalability to improve frame rates further. Both the GTX 1070 and RX 6500 XT do pretty well here though, averaging over 65 FPS, while the 1660 Super is capable of 74 FPS on average. Low settings at 1440p, however, is just too much to ask of this caliber of GPU. The 1660 Super and GTX 1070 aren't dreadful, but personally, I would just rather use this class of card at 1080p to boost frame rates that bit higher. Moving on though, Dying Light 2 does of course bring with it a number of ray traced effects, enabling those with a fairly beefy rig with a high-end AMD or RTX GPU to add in some visual flair that would otherwise be missing. So there's a total of five different ray traced options with ambient occlusion, sun shadows, global illumination, reflections, and the ray trace flashlight all featuring here. Now, I'm not going to do a deep dive into every single setting, though I would strongly advise checking out Alex Batali's video on Digital Foundry for a terrific breakdown, but I do have some of my own thoughts to share comparing RT on versus off. In my view, it is clear the ray trace global illumination and shadows really do take Dying Light 2 to the next level. Objects, and particularly foliage, just look so much more grounded and realistic when RT is enabled. Now, I do think part of that, however, is due to the fairly flat lighting in the game when RT isn't enabled, particularly on trees and grass. RT does really help to fix things, though, and it might sound like a bit of an obvious description, but with RT off, the overall presentation just looks very much like a video game, whereas with RT on, you get fewer objects that seem to glow, and it's just a lot more natural looking. Of course though, as we have come to expect, ray tracing is definitely a performance killer, with only the 3080 and 3090 able to run at over 60 FPS with RT set to max, even at 1080p. AMD GPUs do suffer more than their Nvidia counterparts, with the 6800 XT coming in below the RTX 3060 Ti for instance. Up at 1440p as well, not even the mighty RTX 3090 can offer 60 FPS here at native resolution, which I think pretty much tells you everything you need to know about how heavy ray tracing can be. Of course though, that naturally leads us on to where the game's upscaling options can excel. With both DLSS and FSR included here, though curiously there is no FSR ultra quality mode. I do find FSR overall looks noticeably less detailed however, with DLSS offering a much clearer presentation overall. Now, DLSS did have a ghosting bug when I first played the game, but after Wednesday's patch, I didn't notice it anymore, so I'm going to have to assume that was fixed. If not, Techland definitely knows about it and is working on it. Still, if you do have an RTX GPU, DLSS is definitely the way to go to boost performance. Speaking of performance as well, with our final chart, we can actually see here that FSR does offer a bigger performance advantage over DLSS, but DLSS will still give you an extra 30 to 40% FPS boost depending on the resolution. And like I said, it just looks better overall. So if you do have an RTX GPU, that is the option to enable. So that has been it for our look at Dying Light 2. 
and I'd definitely say it has its moments, but equally so there are areas to improve upon. Credit has to go to Techland though, they've been very transparent with the things they already have fixed and the things they are going to fix, so I'm particularly hopeful that exposing a few extra video settings will definitely help improve the overall scalability of the game, as it can be very tough, particularly if you have an older or low-end GPU. Those with beefier rigs that are ray tracing capable will definitely want to tinker with the RT settings, as in my view, they are transformative. Without ray tracing, I can just find the game looks a bit flat in terms of its lighting and quite last gen overall, which may well be a consequence of the development delays. Dying Light 2 was of course meant to come out in early 2020 initially, so it does seem to be a bit of a cross gen engine. In terms of the overall performance then, it is definitely on the heavy side, with lower than average performance numbers across the board. I would say it is a mostly good looking title, though some areas can look a bit bland, I'd personally like to see higher quality textures as well, while I also noticed a couple of examples of animation hitching, so like I said there is definitely room for improvement here. GPU performance between AMD and Nvidia does appear to be pretty well balanced though, despite this game being sponsored by the green team, AMD GPUs definitely haven't been crippled in any way, and actually I'd say the Vega architecture is punching well above its weight. The key benefit to having an Nvidia GPU is if you are on RTX technology, DLSS really is going to make this game much more playable and a much more enjoyable experience overall. So if you do have an RTX GPU, definitely check it out. That is going to do it for this video though guys, so I hope you enjoyed it. If you have already been playing Dying Light 2, of course I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts down below, how are you finding performance and also what are your thoughts on the gameplay. Do let me know your thoughts. Please do subscribe and ding that notification bell if you haven't already. You can also come chat with us over on our Discord server, which is linked in the description below. While you're there, you can also find a link to our merch store, and it would also be awesome if you would consider backing us on Patreon, where you can see some of our content early and get access to exclusive giveaways. That is going to do it for this one though, guys. I'm Dominic Fortkit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.